I can always tell when my staff has written my bio because they tell you everything about me except the fact that I was president of my third grade class <laughs> two years in a row. There's hope for everybody. What I want to do tonight is talk a little bit about the challenge of building a national museum. And let me begin with a story that has shaped my career, but has also shaped this museum. Early in my career at the Smithsonian, I was asked to curate a huge exhibition on the history of the 19th century. And one aspect of that was going to look at slavery. But I didn't want to look at slavery writ large. I wanted to focus on it through the lens of a single plantation. So I traveled all around the country, visiting sugar plantations in Louisiana. I went to cotton plantations in Alabama, looked at tobacco plantations in Virginia and North Carolina. And then I was taken to a rice plantation outside of Georgetown, South Carolina, the old Friendfield Rice Plantation. And when I went down the road, suddenly I turned the corner and there were 10 slave cabins from the 1840s and 50s still standing. Next to one of the cabins was a man named Mr. Johnson. He was 95 years old. And he had lived in one of those cabins with his enslaved grandmother. So for a historian, this was the Holy Grail. Somebody that actually could talk about what it was like to be enslaved in that cabin. And he was wonderful. He took me to the front of the cabin and he talked about how the enslaved took a broom and swept the ground so it was so hard so there'd be no grass or no vermin. He took me to one side and he talked for about an hour about the role children played in making sure the chimney didn't catch fire or fall down. He took me to the back and he talked about the crops that his grandmother grew that would supplement what the owner gave them. And then we went to the fourth side, or rather I did, he didn't come. And I said, Mr. Johnson, why don't you come over here and tell me what happened over here? And he said, son, I'm not going over there. Now, I'm this young scholar. I think, okay, there's going to be something really cool here. So I said, Mr. Johnson, please, I came all the way from Washington. Please come over here. And he said, son, I'm not going to go over there because there's nothing but rattlesnakes over there. <laughs> now, after I stopped running, uh, I said to Mr. Johnson, why didn't you tell me? And he said, son, people used to remember. Now they forget. And if you're really a historian, your job is to help make sure people remember not just what they want, but what they need. And in some way, that line has stayed with me my whole career. And in some ways, this museum has really been the struggle for people over 100 years to build a museum that would help people remember not just what they want to know, what they need to know about the African American experience. This idea began back in 1913. That was the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And they had, you see, maybe you've seen these pictures of old Yankees and old rebels shaking hands, but there was never anybody black in those pictures. This got people excited to create a museum. They began to raise money. And then World War I happened, no museum. They started again in the 20s, and Calvin Coolidge, now you never get to say that name, Calvin Coolidge actually passed legislation to create a museum in 1929. What happened in 29? The great crash, no museum. In essence, this idea just kept coming up and never got anywhere until the 1980s and 90s when people began to realize that the civil rights generation was passing and they decided that they wanted to put a museum to remember those folks. But the reality is that this museum happened in part for the first time in 2003 when the legislation was passed, when it was really bipartisan. It's the first time you had Republicans and Democrats. You had John Lewis, the great leader of the civil rights movement, and his partner was, believe it or not, Sam Brownback, the current governor of Kansas. Strange bedfellows. Um, but the reality is they came together to support building this museum. And ultimately, the legislation is passed and signed in 2003, and I came back in 2005 to run this. So the real question was, as I began to wrestle with this, is what should a national museum be that wrestles with African American history, that really is the 21st century museum? I mean, part of it was easy. Part of it was realizing that this had to be a place that would help America to remember, 
to remember the richness, to remember the stories, to remember the people in African American history that you know, the Frederick Douglasses, the Martin Luther Kings, the Rosa Parks, maybe remember them in different ways, in new ways. But if this museum was going to be successful, it also had to introduce you to an array of people who fell outside of the narrative. It had to help you remember the enslaved woman who got up every day and fed her kids before she went into the field and who refused to let the field strip her of her humor, of her humanity. It had to help you remember the families that left Mississippi for the south side of Chicago in 1913 in search of a better day. It had to help you remember people like my own grandmother, who took in other people's laundry, who scrubbed other people's floors so her children and grandchildren wouldn't have to. This museum had to help Americans confront their tortured racial past. It had to be a place where you could cry as you ponder the pain of slavery or segregation. But it also had to be a place where you found the joy that is in this community. You had to be able to tap your toes to Duke Ellington or Louis Armstrong or Aretha Franklin or somebody from the hip hop world, I have no idea who it is, but uh, somebody. But in some ways, if the museum was simply about remembering, I'm not sure that's enough. In some ways, what this museum really is, is an institution that takes African American culture and use it as a lens to understand what it means to be an American. To say that in essence, this is not a story of black people for black people and by black people. It really is a story that in many ways is the quintessential American story. When you wanna understand our core values of optimism, spirituality, resiliency, where better to look than within this community? When you wanna think about how notions of citizenship and equality have been expanded, look towards this community. So in a way, the goal of this museum is to say, this is a story that is too big to be in the hands of one community. This is a story that has shaped us all. This is a story that tells us profoundly about who we are as Americans. So in essence, when you come to this museum, regardless of race, regardless of who you are, regardless of whether your family's been here 200 years or got here 20 minutes ago, this is your story. And in essence, it seemed to me that to craft the 21st Century Museum, you also had to realize that how do you help Americans grapple with something they're not very good at? And that is international concerns. We don't do global very well in America. And that the goal was to recognize that we could craft a museum that would help us understand how international considerations have shaped this community and how this community has shaped globally. And it really came home to me when I was on a trip to what was once called Lapland, near the Arctic Circle. It has to do with third grade geography. I won't bore you with the stories, but I'm sitting under a reindeer tent with a village elder. And through the translator, the elder says, I have two questions. First question, are you an American? Got it, easy. Second question, do you know Al Green? I said, Al Green, the musician? He said, absolutely. And so here I am in the middle of nowhere, and this guy's talking about Al Green. Told me a little bit about the power of this culture. And when I came back, I called Al Green. He said, of course they know about me, but you know, <laughs> that's Al Green. So the reality is that when I think about the challenges of building this museum, I realize that 11 years ago, we began with a staff of two. We had no idea where the museum would be, obviously had no architecture, no architect, but also, almost unlike any other museum, this one had not a single collection, not a single artifact. It had no money, although that's not true. My daughter did give us $7.36 to start. Um, but what we had was a vision. What we had was a desire, a belief, to be able to fulfill the dreams of many generations. But I have to be honest, I would wake up and say to myself, at eight o'clock in the morning, I have the best job in America. And at two o'clock in the morning, it's the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> because just think about some of the challenges that we faced. The simple challenge of, what were the conceptual challenges that you faced? Think about it. On the one hand, you had nothing to do with, to, to constrain you. So it could be anything. So you begin to say, what does African-American mean? 
in the 21st century? What does Africa mean in an African-American museum? What does a national museum mean in a transnational age? He began to think about, out of all the stories you tell, how do you figure out what you talk about? How can you craft a museum that can both be about yesterday, but also about today and tomorrow? Can you really craft a museum that will allow us to wrestle with questions that have divided us, that would allow us to find reconciliation, healing, hope? Can you craft a museum that's goal is simple? Can you craft a museum that could make America better? And that's the kind of thing we began to wrestle with. I began to try to figure out, can you humanize history? Can you reduce it to human scale? Can you help the public embrace the ambiguity, the complexity, the nuance in a museum? Because museums often give simple answers to complex questions. Can we help the public embrace ambiguity? In some ways, the real challenge for us was to figure out you start putting on the walls on yellow sheets of paper all the different stories, and you realize you've got seven, eight exhibitions. So we begin to lay them out. Do you do civil rights? Do you do slavery? Do you do sports? Do you do the military? Do you do fine art? Next thing you know, you realize you needed four buildings. And so the challenge for us was to make this work in one single building. But conceptual challenges I thought were going to be difficult, but they paled in comparison to some of the other challenges. One of the most amazing challenges, well, let's see how I can say this, um, was the challenge of managing Congress. <laughs> now, as you know, Congress is the biggest donor of this museum and of the Smithsonian. So part of what you want to do is work with Congress to make sure that you get the support you need. But I remember very early on in this process, I was told by the Smithsonian senior people that I needed to go meet some people on the Hill and meet a particular member of Congress who was a big appropriator. And they said, well now, he's not gonna like you, so get ready for this. Um, and I said, what's he not gonna like? He doesn't even know me. He says, he doesn't like the Smithsonian, he's not gonna like you, but you have to go do this. So, the night before I was to see him, I was at a reception at the Library of Congress, and so was he. So I went up, and he was a congressman from North Carolina. My mother's from North Carolina, so I played the game. My mom's from North Carolina, let's talk about North Carolina. And the guy was very friendly, so I figured, how hard can this be? Well, the next day, I walk into his office, and first of all, he's got one of those desks where he's up here and you're down here. And I walk in, and he's got 10 members of his staff standing against the wall with their arms crossed. So I said to him, well, Congressman, it's good to see, and he cuts me right off. He says, listen, I know why you're here. You want me to support you and the Smithsonian. I don't like the Smithsonian. I don't like you. And in fact, I think that what I'll do is I will give you $25,000, make it a website, and go away. Well, I'm sitting here going, now what do I say? Now, part of me is a Jersey kid that says you want to fight, um, <laughs> but you can't do that. So then I said, I said, well, sir, as he kept saying, here, make it a website and go away. I said, well, you know, I worked at the Museum of American History for many years, and one of the things I've seen is the power of the authentic, how people respond when they see the Star Spangled Banner or the Greensboro lunch counter that I collected years ago. Well, all of a sudden, he starts to get red and shake, and he starts to just grab his head, and I'm thinking, Christ, he's gonna have a heart attack. And I had this vision, bunch kills member of Congress, <laughs> career over. He started to cry. Well, his staff kind of moves me out, and I'm sitting there going, okay, what did I do? And he comes out, and he said to me, I had forgotten that I was in college at Wake Forest when the Greensboro lunch counter sit-ins occurred, and I raised money to bail people out. And he put his arm around me, and he said, thank you for helping me to remember. I'm not going to give you any money, but thanks for helping me to remember. <laughs> The good news has been, however, I won't say that he lost his, he's lost his re-election bid because of that, but he lost his re-election bid. Um, but the good news is that many people in Congress became great supporters of the museum. 
I realized that we needed to have 30 angels, 30 people who would sort of speak on our behalf. And we've been very fortunate to get the support from Congress. So that really has worked in a way that I wasn't sure it would. But I'll tell you what I think was in some ways the biggest challenge for me. And that was managing the conflicting expectations of what this museum would be. I received a letter that began, Dear Left-Wing Historian. So I knew it wasn't a fan letter. But the letter I took very seriously. He wrote, what happened to the Smithsonian I loved? It used to celebrate America. It used to explore American greatness. Now you're coming to talk about things better left unsaid. And then he wrote this amazing line. He said, after all, don't you know, America's greatest strength is its ability to forget. I'm out of a job. Um, but he goes on then to say this museum shouldn't be built. Historians like me should be fired and shouldn't work at the Smithsonian. But I must admit, it threw me off because he signed it. Best wishes for your continued success. <laughs> but ultimately, balancing the different expectations has been really one of the big challenges. Think about it. I get letters from people who say to me, this has to be a Holocaust museum. This has to be a museum that says what they did to us. I have other people who stop me on the street and hug me and then say, but please don't talk about slavery. Or I realize that one of the great challenges is that for this museum to work, it has to do something that the Holocaust Museum doesn't have to do. It has to illuminate all the dark corners of America. It has to help Americans wrestle with their own culpability. One of the great challenges is how do we as a people who view ourselves as always the good guys realize that there were times that we weren't the good guys? And how to help people explore that has been one of the great challenges of this. And I have to t I'd love to tell you that we figured it all out, but I think the reality is we're probably gonna anger a whole lot of people one way or another. Um, but the goal here is to recognize that we want to create a museum that provides the right tension. Tension between tragedy and celebration. Between resiliency and understanding what it took to survive. To talk, to craft a museum that basically says, you can only understand America if you actually look at it through this lens. So in many ways, the challenge of really trying to craft a museum that will appeal to so many people has been one of the great challenges. But I'll tell you the challenge that surprised me, and that is the challenge of building a staff. When we started, we had a staff of two. Now there are 200 people working to birth this museum. And the challenge I thought was going to be um, maybe to find people who could do the work we have to do. Well, that hadn't been the challenge at all. I keep thinking of Abraham Lincoln, who once said, God save me from office seekers. I mean, the joy is that everybody wants to work. I got a call not too long ago from a woman who said to me, I'd like you to hire my daughter. And she described what her daughter did, and I said, well, we're not looking for that. And she said, don't you recognize my name? We graduated high school together. So I was sitting there going, Joanne, Joanne, Joanne. Then I remembered I didn't like her in high school. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't hold that against her daughter, but. But what I realized is that the challenge of building a staff was really not even getting good people, but getting people who could handle the visibility, handle the pressure, handle the stress that this was such a high profile thing that you couldn't fail. And often, I would hire good people, and what they, I would say to them is, look, we're making this up as we go along. I want you to craft the biggest educational program online that we could do. Well, often they'd come back and say, well, here's a curriculum package on the Civil War. People would get small rather than get expansive. And so part of the big challenge from my vantage point has been, how do you help people recognize that this is your chance to test all your ideas, to experiment, to do what you want, to basically try to make this museum the model. That has been one of the real challenges. But ultimately, when you said what kept me up at night, what kept me up at night was building the collections. 
Because even if you built the most technologically sophisticated museum of the Smithsonian, it would fail. Because you go to the Smithsonian, what? To see the Wright Flyer, the Ruby Slippers, the Greensboro Lunch Counter. So my fear was, how do I find the stuff of history? And because I had been at the Smithsonian so long, I knew that even if I went into every storeroom of the Smithsonian and said, let me take this stuff, it would still only give us 20% of what we needed. So I had to believe that all of the 20th century and most of the 19th century and some of the 18th century was still in basements, trunks, and attics. So basically, we stole the antique roadshow idea. I admit it, I steal from anybody. And what we did is we began to bring together people who knew how to preserve grandma's old shawl or that wonderful 19th century photograph. And we'd go into communities and we'd partner with local museums and we would basically have classes on how to preserve photographs, how to take care of textiles, but we'd say, bring out your stuff. And we'd look at it and often people would say, well, we want to give this to you. And I would always say, first and foremost, give it to the local museums. If we are in LA or Chicago or Jackson, Mississippi, give it to those museums first. Now, I have to admit, in the scholarly parlance, if it was really cool, it came back to DC. Um, but the goal was to basically create a conversation that said, what you have in your basements, in your trunks, in your attics, is the stuff of history. You may not be Martin Luther King or Frederick Douglass, but your family stories have shaped this country. And we wanted to make sure that you shared those stories, you brought those collections. And I'll tell you, as a result of that, we found things that I just couldn't believe. I keep thinking of a man who came to one of these and then called me later and said, I have material from Harriet Tubman. Would you like to see it? Now, I'm a 19th century historian, and I said, there's no material on Harriet Tubman in this country. I'm not going to waste my time. And he said, well, look, why don't you at least come to Philadelphia and take a look? So I figure, it's not a long train ride. I get a Philadelphia cheesesteak out of the deal. So what the heck? So I go to Philadelphia, and this man who was a great collector of books, who was 6'2", 300 pounds, big guy, he takes out a little box. And he reaches in and he pulls out photographs of Harriet Tubman that no one had ever seen. Well, he's got my attention. He starts pulling out material that's just amazing. And every time he pulls something out, if I got excited, he would get excited and he'd punch me. <laughs> so I was afraid to get excited because it hurt. Um, but then he pulled out a shawl, an amazing shawl. There's a picture of Harriet Tubman a couple days before she died, wrapped in a shawl. He pulled that shawl out. And then he pulled out her hymnal that had all those spirituals she would sing when she went into the South. Steal away Jesus, swing low sweet chariot. And even though she couldn't read, she kept that hymnal with her. By the time he brought that out, I'm crying. Everybody's crying. And then he said what I've never forgotten. He said, you know, I could sell this. I could make money. But the reality is it deserves to be seen by the public, so it's yours. So I said, sign the paper. He signed it, took it back. But in a way, that kind of generosity has what has really shaped our ability to collect, to find things. I'm struck by a woman who came into my office and said, I've got a bag of stuff from World War I. My grandfather was a black soldier in World War I. That's all I know. Well, she dumped the stuff, and we looked at it, and it turned out her grandfather was a member of the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th. And they were, as many of you know, a black unit that the U.S. government initially didn't know what to do with, so the U.S. government sent them overseas, and they fought in French uniforms under the French control. And they were so good, they received the French version of the Medal of Honor, the Croix de Guerre. There on my table was his Croix de Guerre from 1919. And again, she said, this is yours for the Smithsonian, for the public. Or I think about a woman who came to me after a talk like this, who said, I quit college to go south to help register blacks in the 1960s. And I was in Birmingham when the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed. I've been keeping this for years, and do you want them? They were shards of glass from the stained glass windows blown out at the 16th Street Baptist Church. So the way people have been sharing their materials, bringing their stories forward, has really made this possible. And we went from collecting zero artifacts 
to now having 40,000 artifacts that can tell this story. But I guess for me, the one that really stays with me more than anything else was, you know, I had been spending years trying to find remnants of a slave ship. I had gone over the world because most of the ships that carried the enslaved are on the ocean floor. So I actually created a project called the Slave Wrecks Project to try to map the ocean floor to find these wrecks. And I thought I found one. I found one that left Bristol, Rhode Island in 1794, went to Cape Coast in Ghana, picked up 144 Africans, was on its way to an American-owned plantation outside of Matanzas, which is about 60 miles east of Havana in Cuba. And I thought we could find it. I spent years negotiating in Cuba. Uh, we didn't get what I thought we'd find. But then I found through colleagues in South Africa another ship, a ship that had gone to West Africa, had been chased away by the British, and was on its way to Mozambique, picked up 520 people from the Makua tribe in Mozambique, was on its way to the New World, and it sank off the coast of Cape Town. And thanks to work with colleagues overseas, we actually found the ship, dove on it, and brought up pieces of the ship that will be in the museum. But what really hit me is I went back to Mozambique, and I went to where the Makua people lived. And the chief of the Makua people basically had this ceremony, and he said, I want to give you a gift. And he gave me this amazing vessel with cowrie shells um, that he said, this is for you. I opened it and it's full of dirt. I'm like, okay, um, you know, I guess this is a good gift, thank you. And he said to me, do you not understand? I want you to take this, and when you go back to the site of where the ship sank off the coast of Cape Town in South Africa, I want you to sprinkle this dirt over the ship so for the first time since 1798, my people can sleep in their own land. I mean, I just, you know, just amazing to me to be able to do that. So those kinds of things have really helped to shape what we do and what we are. And literally, when you come to the museum, you will see things that I didn't believe existed. Now, I told everybody, sure, 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 we can find it, but I was lying. Um, and now we have material that can tell the story of America through this lens. But let me talk about the last two, two big challenges. One was raising money. You know, in my little town that I grew up in, one of the gas stations had a sign that said, cash makes no enemies, let's be friends. So I spent a lot of time searching for friends. And when we had to build this museum, this was to be the first time the Smithsonian had a large public-private partnership. The museum was gonna cost roughly $500 million. Congress would pay half, but of course that meant working with Congress to get them to actually pay half. And then we had to find the other parts of it. And I have to be honest, I didn't think, I thought, okay, this is gonna be hard, but how hard could it really be? And I remember the first gift I got was a million dollar gift. I thought, geez, a million, this is pretty cool. A million dollar gift, and then somebody said to me, now all you need is just 500 more. <laughs> okay, I got it. But what has been really powerful has been on the one hand, an amazing group of people agreed to serve on the board of this museum to help do that. So you have people like Ken Chenault, the CEO of American Express, Oprah Winfrey, Colin Powell, Laura Bush. I mean, a kind of who's who. But what they did is basically help because they believed in the vision. And they helped to open doors for us to slowly but surely raise the money we needed. But I'll tell you what makes me proud, that yes, we have huge corporate support that has been wonderful. Normally when you do a building campaign, you get about 17% of your money from the corporate community. We're gonna get about 49%. But what really hits me is all the new money we found. Amazing array of African Americans, of sororities and fraternities who have basically said, we will actually contribute significant money. And there's even been an African-American church, Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, that gave a million dollars. Now think about the last time a church gave a million dollars to a museum. And so, but what really makes this work for me has been the fact that we have 100,000 people who have joined as members. That is more members than any other museum in the Smithsonian. They're open. Part of where this idea came from 
was early in my career, I was doing work in California, and I was talking to a, an elderly woman, she's probably my age now, but she seemed old as dirt then, right? And, and I was talking to her, and I said, I'd like to have that old oval photograph that you have in front of you. And she said, well, you can have the photograph, but you can't have what's stuck in the frame. So I climb up and I get the photograph down, and in the frame was her father's membership card from the NAACP from 1913. And I never forgot how important that was. So now one of the great joys is having all these people as members who stop me on the street, who stop me in the airport, and pull out their membership card. I was flying back from Paris three weeks ago, trying to you know, wait that eternal wait once you go through security. This guy comes up to me and says, I want to show you something, and he pulls out his membership card. So for me, the fact that 100,000 people said, I want to own this, I may only give $25 or $50, but I want to be a part of that. And in a way, what that means is we are so close to raising our goal that by the time the museum opens, I guarantee we will be way past our goal. And it's really been wonderful to me to realize that at a time of the economy falling apart, of rigid political partisanism, partisanship, we've been able to get that support. And that's been really because of so many of you in this, in this room as well. But I guess, let me talk about what is what I think the last and maybe the most interesting part of the challenges, and that is building the building. Now I have to tell you, the day it was announced that I was gonna take this job, I was living in Chicago, and I was, I was out of the country. By the time I got back, there were 15 packets from architects already who said they wanted to build a museum. Before we even knew where it would be, architects were sending plans to me. Some were amazingly beautiful, some were amazingly bizarre. One of the ones I received was somebody sent me 150 pages of drawings of the museum next to the Washington Monument built in the shape of a black power fist. Now, there's many things I can do, but somehow getting this through Congress, I didn't think so. Yeah, you know, didn't think so. But what I realized is that how do I answer the question? What's the building look like? Well, I wanted a building that spoke of spirituality, uplift, and resiliency. And I wanted a building that didn't look like every other white marble building on the mall. And I also wanted this to be the first green museum on the mall. And so when we began to wrestle with this, it also dawned on me that what I wanted was a building that had a little color to it. Because I realized that there has always been a dark presence in America that often was undervalued, not seen, neglected. And I thought it'd be important to say that on this mall. And so in a way, you can begin to see what this building began to look like. And I'll tell you why. This is where it's located, so it's a pretty good location. Um, yeah, and um, as somebody wrote, I would never say this, but I got the best office in DC. Okay, I got great views, but so when you come, you can get to see those views. But what I really wanted to do was to basically, uh, let me get to the building. Where's the building? Okay, basically what I wanted to do was to figure out how do you make a building that is signature and distinct, but still works with the rest of the museums in the mall. And part of what we did is, you'll see and I'll show you, there is a corona that covers this building. And that corona is in the shape of angles, 19, 17 degree angles. And where they came from is, I came across a picture of black women in prayer in the early 20th century, and their hands were at this angle. So we took that angle and used that to make the building. And then what we did is I wanted to create a distinctive corona on the building. And the architects knew that they wanted to do something that was kind of a, brass, uh, a bronze based, and you couldn't have solid bronze. So they were going to sort of use a sort of mathematical formulas and you know, make some holes in it so that it wouldn't be solid. Well, I thought, why would you do that? Why don't you? take the idea that says there's so much of African-American history that's hidden in plain sight. So what I did is I said, let us go back to the craftsmen, the enslaved craft people who did the iron work in Charleston, the screens and iron work in New Orleans. And that's what we did. We took those screens and we then made that over the entire building. 
So basically, this corona is over the entire building. So that in essence, what it does is you can see it glistens in different light. It carries itself differently. Um, it obviously is also part of how we make it a green museum. But I really wanted something that basically said, when you see this building, it's a homage to the fact that so much of our history is hidden in plain sight. And that was really important to me. And so now the building is done um, on the National Mall, and we're now in the process of installing all the artifacts and the like. But if you could see, um, there's angle on the corona. Should I get a go? There you go. So that angle is the degrees that I, we picture the, those women in prayer. And it's also, this is what works in Washington, it also happens to be the same angle at the top of the Washington Monument. So I can say how the building dances with the buildings around it. Okay, I'm a historian, I can't get... But so basically what I wanted was a building that would be memorable, that would light up, that would really sort of be a signature building, and I think you will really love it when you see it. Great views. Um, Great challenge, obviously, because it's built on the corner of 14th and 15th and Constitution. And so it's really at a prime location. It's the westernmost end of the Smithsonian. Everywhere you go, you can see it. And also, one of the things that was really important to me is that because this is my third Smithsonian Museum, I realized that when you go into a building on the mall, you go into the building. You forget that you're on the mall. I thought the mall was such sacred ground but I wanted to create vistas so that when you saw the exhibition on the March on Washington, you could look out and see the Lincoln Memorial. Or in this particular case, you can see the monuments. One of the vistas we have, we have a major exhibition on the history of the African American in the military, and there is a lens that peers out towards Arlington Cemetery. And in that lens, we've done an exhibition on all the African Americans who were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. And some of them are buried in Arlington Cemetery, so you can actually see where they're at rest. And so the goal was to really take advantage of the landscape as well. So the key was to have different kinds of vistas, to take advantage of the sun. There's beautiful dappling in the building throughout. Beautiful light and spaces where you can see through just so you can have great vistas. And in essence, that's the building. So the challenge for us was, how do you build a building that is signature but also works as a museum. And I have to be honest, when I began to think about all of this, I wasn't smart enough to know how hard this was. But what I realized is with the support of good people and many people around the country and the world, we can do this. But I must admit, not too long ago, I was asked by a reporter, well, what happens if you fail? And normally I'm pretty good with, but I didn't know what to say. And then I remembered. One of the things I do is I only have one superstition. I do not get on an airplane unless I shine my shoes, which means I know shoe shine people everywhere. You name the airport, I can tell you exactly where they are. So when I go into a town, I usually spend three or four days and I'm pretty visible. So I was flying back from Dallas and I stopped to get my shoe shine. It was an elderly African-American man and he starts to shine my shoes, and he looks up and he says, are you that museum guy from Washington? I said, yeah. He doesn't say anything else. He shines my shoes, he finishes. I reach into my pocket, I hand him $8. He said to me, keep it for the museum. Now I gotta be honest, this is a shoe shine guy. So I basically said, listen man, here, take this money, you need this money. And he said to me, don't be disrespectful. <laughs> I got it. Don't you realize that even if I don't know exactly what's in a museum, that maybe this museum might be the only place where my grandchildren get to understand what life did to me and what I did to life. So for me, this is not about building a beautiful building. Oh, the building's gorgeous. It's not about crafting exhibitions that will be ripe with education and technology, although they will be. It's not even about finding Harriet Tubman shawl or amazing material. What it's about, because what that guy reminded me, is this museum is about making America better. It's about helping people understand who we once were, 
give people some context to understand the world we live today and maybe point us towards what we can become. So ultimately, the National Museum of African American History looks back and looks ahead. And with your support, as my youngest daughter said, once this museum opens, as long as there's an America, there's a chance to tell this story. How humbling is that? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm told that I can answer some questions. Let me ans answer the first question right away. Yes, I'm a Yankee fan, okay? Let's get, let's get that out of the way. Somebody in the back. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so inspired right now for a variety of reasons. When I saw the picture before the, uh, t your talk started, I'm a native Washingtonian, and I was trying to figure out how could you have the Washington Monument and the museum building and all that space? Like, where could it possibly be? So I'm so glad you showed us. And I think that, that where it is is kind of a metaphor for something that's very important to me that you said, which is essentially that this is an American museum about the African American experience, but I've always believed that every American should embrace our history as their own. And that means so much to me that you said that. I think it's a very 21st century way of seeing things and I'm so appreciative of that. Um, I saw you and others on C-SPAN um, at the, no, no, no. Oh. It was wonderful at the African American, it was a conference on African American history. Ah, the future history. of the African American past. Yeah, I think it was history and culture, but anyway, it was a number of panels and so forth. And I was just curious, and this may be too much to ask this question since you've just finished this building, but are you anticipating sort of incorporating either satellite activities or, you know, for those of us who love Washington for its museums, it's so frustrating not to be able to be there as much as we could be. I think the the, one of the issues we wrestled with was how, do you, how are you really a 21st century museum? So part of that is working collaboratively with institutions around the globe. So I actually have a staff of 15 people whose job it is just to develop partnerships and collaborations so that we have shared artifacts, we've organized, for example, the African American um, network of museums in Florida. We have, for example, around the opening of the museum, we'll be doing watch parties in museums around the country um, that will be able to tell this story. We obviously will craft traveling exhibitions. My belief is pretty clear. If we're successful and other institutions that care about African American culture aren't, then we failed. So we really want to make sure that we can take advantage of the technology that gives us opportunities to share and engage in ways that we couldn't 10, 15 years ago. So that's our goal. First of all, I want to thank you for your talk. And incidentally, yes. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned that uh, in World War I you had found someone that had some diaries and I'd like to say that right now, this week, I found my diaries of my father from World War I and we are in the process of translating them and we're going to perhaps send them to you once they're... Well, that's very exciting. Thank you. That's wonderful. I appreciate cool. that. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited. I'm a proud member. Well, thank you. And um, I received information that the museum is opening on September the 24th. And as soon as I got that, I made my reservations for the hotel. Mm -hmm. But I haven't gotten any other information. And I don't want to go there and not be able to participate. So I want to know what's happening. The joy of opening a museum is harder than building the museum. 
Um, what we're going to do is there's going to be a special event for the members that you'll be receiving an invitation. Um, the invitations will go, I guess the save the dates are going to go out in the next two weeks. And we're having, as you could imagine, opening the museum, there are 29 events between September 14th and September 24th. What will happen is on the 24th, President Obama will open the museum, will give the opening address, we will have, we expect probably 25 to 50,000 people who will be there for the opening. Um, as I said in a newspaper interview the other day, it's kind of like a mini inauguration. Um, so we're working now at how do you handle all those crowds, how do you make this work. What I tell people is, you want to be there for that moment, please come. You want to really enjoy the museum, come in October. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'm just saying. Um, but... That's what we're going to do. So those of you who have been supporters, you will be hearing from us. Um, next week, on, there will be a website that will go online, go live, just about this, answering all the questions you may have. Hi, Mr. Bunch. It's a pleasure listening to you here today. My name is Louise Wickfall. I sent you a copy of my play, The 44th President, which I also sent to President Barack Obama. It would give me great pleasure that my play be shown at your, the uh, museum for the world to see. I had had many offers from producers on Broadway, and I turned their offer down because I figure um, I need all races, everyone, school, college, seniors, to see my play. And if my play is on Broadway, they cannot afford the ticket. It is such a historical piece of work. I don't know if you get a chance to read it, but I'd love when you have the time to just review it and please call me. Thank you very much. I mean, one of the joys have been that people have reached out and shared their creativity. Your play that I remember um, has been, my, my head of public programs has it right now. So we'll read it, okay? You're right. Hi, I'm Carol and Seki, and I. Dear, how are you, Carol? Good. Good. Great, actually. But I've had the pleasure of working with Lonnie Bunch in the museum field, and um, I have a question, and it's based on my own family background of being Japanese American and not learning about the history of my family until I was a teenager, and um, I was wondering. I was under the impression for most of my life that there was there were not many stories that were passed on in the African-American communities about slavery, that it was two, one generation or two generations too far back. But now it seems like you're discovering many, many stories and objects. What do you think has kept people from sh sharing the stories or sharing the stories beyond the, their families? Or have they shared them with their families? I think in some ways, slavery in many cases, the last great unmentionable, right? Um, people are really ambivalent. There are people who, I've had people come to me to say, please don't talk about slavery because it's embarrassing, right? I personally believe I wish I was as strong as my enslaved ancestors. Um, so I think that what has happened though is that the museum has given people license to share these stories um, because a lot were passed down but they were basically not the stories you wanted to share. And so part of what we hope will happen candidly in this museum is while there are a lot of stories we want people to share, but we really want people to think differently about enslavement, to think differently because it's a story that has shaped us all. It's the story that shaped the American engine of culture, economic prosperity, but it's also a story that profoundly shaped the African-American experience and to this day still shapes it. So for us, if we can illuminate the dark corners of enslavement, then we will have done a major contribution. So I think the museum is getting people to talk about those issues. And I think that the fact that you're on the mall, your Smithsonian Institution really gives a lot of um, confidence and hope to people because it, it's, it's like being really respected, and you're, the, actually when my um, mother saw the exhibit about the Japanese American internment camps at the American Smithsonian History Museum, it was the first time she ever talked about her experience in the camps. Yeah. But she felt like you legitimized 
her story and that it was not, nothing to be embarrassed about or pressured by the government to, to be a good American, but she could tell her story after that exhibit came out. So thank you. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Hi, it's a great pleasure to see you here. I think the last time I saw you, they were doing your DNA up in, in uh, New York. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. at the other historical society. Anyway, I'm a native of Washington, D.C. Uh, I just want to say one thing before I ask you the question. In my family, we weren't embarrassed about slavery. What mm -hmm. my great aunt said was, why do you want to talk about all that bad stuff? Mm. I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't embarrassment. I think it was out of pain. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to know, because of that mentality that I find that a lot of my friends say was shared by their uh, relatives, what are some of the things that you found besides the shawl? Of, uh, what were some of the other great things that you found that were of that time you mean of the period of slavery? Yes. I think that... I mean, uh, that you want to really talk about, this is a great find. Oh, well, I mean, I think everything. Don't write, you want to give it to this woman right behind there. She went to college with me, so you better give it to her or she's going to get me. <laughs> right there. Yeah. Uh, let me answer the question first, Bergs, okay? Um, but basically, I think that what we've realized is by asking people to share those stories, we found things that are unbelievably powerful and positive. One of the things we found is there was a man named Joseph Trammell who lived in Loudoun County just across the river in Virginia, and he gained his freedom in 1851, and he had his freedom papers. And he realized that that paper was the key to his future, so he didn't want anything to happen to it. So he made what he called a tin wallet, a handmade piece of tin that he made in the shape of a box, and the family told how every day he would put that paper in that tin wallet and took it with him when he went to work because he didn't want sweat or anything to destroy it. And then every night he would come back and put it on the mantelpiece and talk to his family and say, this is our future. The family kept that freedom paper and that tin wallet for four generations, and they gave it to us. So it's those kinds of things that have really happened that, that I think change the way we do things. Carol. <laughs> so my question is, how do you, what's the fine line between the stuff that's, as you talked about, music and sports and even, you know, segregation and then the Ku Klux Klan, how do you decide what you should, what your museum should have opposed to what's already in the Museum of American History. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you take the Ku Klux Klan outfit and bring it to your museum mm -hmm. or do you keep it? How do you, where's the line? Well, I think that because, as I said, this is my third Smithsonian Museum, I thought the most important thing would be never to take everything and put it in one place. Rather, what you want to do is craft each museum to say, we're different portals into what it means to be an American. You might be able to go through the Museum of American History, or you might be able to go through the Smithsonian Art Museum or through our museum. So the goal was never to take, but to do something revolutionary for the Smithsonian, actually to talk to each other and to begin to figure out how we develop programs that support everything. Now, I collected the Greensboro Lunch Counter, which is one of the iconic artifacts in American history. I would never want that to leave American history. So my goal was to say, we can find enough material so that we can have a rich story, but you should also be able to see how American history talks about segregation. They may talk about it a little differently. Or how does the Native American Museum talk about their pride in being an American citizen, which might be different than what we might do. So the goal is that the Smithsonian might be the only place where you can get all those different portals into what it means to be an American. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm a New York City educator, and I would like you to talk a little bit about um, how uh, we could incorporate what you're doing there into our curriculums, um, because New York City is trying, but we're, we're not quite there yet. And we know the gem we have here with Brooklyn Historical Society and Deb Schwartz, and our kids do come here. Um, 
and as well as the New York Historical Society. But how can we make a connection, whether it's through the internet or otherwise, with this new museum? You will already see so much of the educational productivity of my staff. So much of it's online. We've actually created online mid-career rejuvenation for teachers. We've done courses on both online and actual on helping teachers explore difficult issues around race. We've created a variety of sort of interactive, uh, what would you call them, virtual exhibitions that really can be used in the classroom. So the easiest thing to do is really go on our website and just hit education. There's an amazing amount of material there. Um, my educators are really unbelievably gifted. And so I think that part of what we really tried to figure out is what is educational within the museum and what education is there for those that will never come to the museum? And you'll see a lot of that material there. Yes. Hi, how you doing? Over here in the corner. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was, <clears throat> it's really exciting. Um, my question is about um, what is the, what goes into the museum as far as um, contemporary history? Um, we're in a very historic time and um, you know, moments of history are happening every single day. So um, how does that curat um, curatorial process work in mm -hmm. covering what's happening right now? What we do is the museum, unlike most history museums, will end about 2015, right? So that we've collected things like Black Lives Matter that will be in the exhibitions. But also what we do is every quarter, I meet with the curators and I say, okay, what's going on now that we should collect for our colleagues 30, 40 years from now? So that we don't have to worry, like when I started, there were exhibitions I wanted to do, there were no collections. So I wanna make sure that we actually have collected both political things, but also cultural things, to make sure you collect material from the new movie on Nat Turner, The Birth of a Nation. Um, so we actually spend time looking at what we may not ever use, but what the people who follow us will use. So it's an integral part of what we do to plan for tomorrow as well as looking backwards. Yes, hello. Hi, I'm Tiffany Bradley. I'm an art critic, um, and I'd love to hear about how you see the opening in September fitting in with all that's going on on Broadway, um, in fine arts, all of the discourse about race and social justice and how it interplays with the art world. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that one of the things that's important for us that I didn't talk about is that we have a, I have several fine art curators and curators of theater and film, and they have a major role in the museum, both in terms of exhibitionary, but also in terms of public programs. So that we think that one of the great strengths of the Smithsonian is that we're the great convener. We can pull everybody together. So we expect to do a lot of that in the future. I expect us to be one of the most vigorously public program space um, in Washington. And what I'd like to do, if somebody's got an extra 10, 12 million dollars, I'd, I'd like to endow a series of public programs that would allow us to do things in Washington and then take them to five or six or seven other cities. So we've really begun to think about how we make, how we make that happen. We've got one last question here okay. in the back. Hello, um, can you talk a little bit about the logistics of getting all those objects into the museum huh. and how do you start, with what's the beginning and how do you work your way up to the, to the last part of it? Um, right now, my staff is installing 4,000 artifacts, 10,000 photographs, 134 video pieces, and 27 interactives. So it's really a kind of logistical planning. So part of it is that you basically have to get in the things that are really huge first. Right, so even before the building was complete, I put in a segregated railroad car that weighed 80 tons and a guard tower from Angola prison. And those, those will never be moved, so whoever's gonna follow me is gonna be cursing me for a long time, <laughs> but that's in the museum forever. But part of the, the process is really looking at, um, we have a, a detailed schedule of what exhibitions get installed at what time. And the challenge is to basically, the order is, 
get the cases in, get the graphics in, then we get the mounts to build, to hold everything, get the material in. We have to put in the media stuff laugh because the media today is so sensitive to dust and everything, so that comes in last. So that basically, as I told the president when I had lunch with him the other day, I said, we may not be ready on the 23rd, but on the 24th, trust me, we'll be ready. Um, so I think that it really is, and one of the great strengths is that I've got amazingly gifted people who have done this. I mean, imagine, normally when you do even a big museum, you do four or five exhibitions. We're doing 11. I think it's partly living in Chicago where the model is make no little plans. Um, so I think that people will be engaged, but clearly my staff is flat out right now. Well, listen, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it.